Um, good afternoon. Um, we are delighted to welcome you to the first of two webinars in which we will look at the talk construction and adjudication cases of 2015. And this first webinar today will focus on the top five construction cases of 2015. In today's webinar, we will be highlighting the key facts and legal points of each case, identifying specific lessons to be aware of for construction contracts and claims. The second webinar on Tuesday, 3rd of February, will focus on the top five adjudication cases of 2015. And both of these webinars will be recorded and will be available on our Vimeo site, and details of how to access, access this site will be given later on. Just before we begin, to minimise background noise, I have placed you all on mute. If you would like to ask any questions, please do so using the webinar chat function, and we will answer some of these at the end of the webinar. I am Ian Drummond, a partner in the construction and special projects team of Shepherd and Wedderburn, specialising in construction and engineering dispute resolution based in Edinburgh, and I'm joined today by Nathaniel, a solicitor in my team and a chartered civil engineer by professional background. Both Nathaniel and I regularly advise on construction contract issues and disputes across a range of projects and clients. And the cases that we are highlighting today are ones which we think will have a direct impact on many construction contracts, situations and disputes um, in the next few years. Thanks, Ian. So we will look today at the top five construction cases of last year, and for each we will provide an outline of the factual scenario, along with an analysis of the key facts and legal points from the case, whilst drawing out some lessons that can be learned and which we hope can be considered and applied in your future contracts and claims. The cases we are going to look at today are Cavendish Square Holdings against Talal L. Macdisi and Parking Eye Limited against Beavis, which were two appeals heard simultaneously before the Supreme Court and reviewed the principles underlying the law of contractual penalty clauses. Then Hogard against Eon Climate and Renewables UK Robin Rig East Limited is a complex but important appeal case which considered fitness for purpose warranties design liability and reliance on employer-specified defective design guidance. We discussed the first instance decision in last year's webinar, but the Court of Appeal has reversed that decision. Then SSE generation against Hockety Solutions, which examines the mechanics and impact of contractors' all-risk insurance policies held in joint names in relation to claims brought by either party. Then Scottish Power UK PLC against BP Exploration Operating Co, which provides some insight into the limitation and exclusion clauses, as well as contractual interpretation. And finally, NH International Caribbean Limited against National Insurance Property Development Company, which considers notice provisions in contracts and their strict enforcement, and this case really reinforces a judicial trend which is applicable in Scotland. So this year we have cases from a range of jurisdictions and appeal levels, a Supreme Court decision, a Privy Council decision on a Caribbean dispute, an English appeal, and one English and one Scottish first instance decision. Much of our contract law is common across these jurisdictions, and the English courts naturally have a large number of disputes and appeals than we have here in Scotland. So key lessons and the likely future approach of the Scottish courts can still be learned from all of these cases. So we will begin with this joint appeal to the Supreme Court in the cases of Cavendish Square Holdings against Talal El Macdisi and Parking Eye Limited against Beavis. Although the background facts of both cases are markedly different, the Supreme Court considered that the legal questions at issue here, namely penalty clauses, should be addressed in a joint judgment. So the first case concerns the sale of a large marketing company in the Middle East by the founder and owner El Macdisi to Cavendish Square Holdings. Restrictive covenants were put in place in the sale contract, preventing El Macdisi from undertaking competitive work. It was admitted that these covenants had been breached by El Macdisi, and so the dispute centered on two contractual provisions which applied to breaches of the restrictive covenants. The first of these reduced El Macdisi's entitlement under the contract to two conditional payment installments 
The second required L. MacDC to sell his remaining holding to Cavendish at a reduced sum. The effect of these contractual provisions was that L. MacDC would receive $44 million less from the sale. And the Court of Appeal had earlier decided that these two contract provisions were in fact penalties and were thus unenforceable. The second case is a bit more straightforward and was brought by Mr. Beavis, who was challenging an £85 fine levied by the operator of a car park, who was not the car park owner, because Mr. Beavis had stayed longer than the two-hour free period. The Court of Appeal in this case had decided that the £85 fine was not extravagant and unconscionable and therefore was not a penalty. The Supreme Court took the opportunity to fully review the rule on penalties, noting it was the first time in a century that such a full review had been undertaken. The classic authority for penalty clauses remains the speech of Lord Dunedin in Dunlop Pneumatic Tower Company Limited against New Garage and Motor Company Limited, where Lord Dunedin set out a series of propositions on the distinction between liquidated damages and penalties. These propositions have been consistently referred to and relied upon by the court since then and can be summarized as follows. The court must seek to determine whether the sum in question is in truth a penalty, but the use of words like liquidated damages or penalty in the contract itself is largely irrelevant. A penalty is a sum designed to threaten the offending party to prevent breach, whereas true liquidated damages should be a genuine pre-estimate of the of the damage to compensate the innocent party for its likely loss. An extravagant and unconscionable sum is a likely pointer to the sum being a penalty, but the difficulty or impossibility of making a precise pre-estimate is no obstacle to that pre-estimate being considered an acceptable liquidated damage. Through developments over the last century, a clause may further survive, even if it is extravagant and unconscionable, if there is some other commercial justification for the clause. The Supreme Court noted that whilst the penalty rule, in their words, is an ancient haphazardly constructed edifice which has not weathered well, and indeed they said that it would be unlikely to be created by the courts now, that it nevertheless serves as a useful purpose which had not been wholly diminished by consumer protection legislation. They agreed that Lord Dunedin's original tests were generally still applicable for simple cases, but went on to say that the development of penalty clause law for more complex circumstances was unsatisfactory, drawing as it, as it had a distinction between penalties and a genuine pre-estimate of loss. So firstly, the court distinguished between, on the one hand, a primary contractual obligation, which the courts don't interfere with or consider the fairness of, and then on the other hand, a secondary obligation, which itself is the remedy for the breach of a primary obligation, i.e. a liquidated damages clause. And the penalty clause rule does regulate that type of secondary obligation. This means that conditional primary obligations, e.g. a provision that a specified sum will be paid unless an optional obligation is performed, would not actually engage the penalty clause rules at all. Whereas an obligation which has to be performed, a primary obligation, the failure of which will trigger the payment of a sum, which in itself is a secondary obligation, will engage the penalty clause rules. That is not new law as such, but is a useful clarification. Secondly, the court went on to provide guidance as to when the penalty clause rules would be broken if they are engaged as I've just set out. The test of whether a clause will be considered a penalty is whether the impugned provision is a secondary obligation which imposes a detriment on the contract breaker out of all proportion to any legitimate interest of the innocent party in the enforcement of the primary obligation. That phrase echoes the extravagant and unconscionable language of previous cases but moves away from the genuine pre-estimate of loss doctrine. The court held that a damages clause can be justified by other considerations too than simply the desire to recover compensation for a breach, such as wider economic or social policy considerations. So in the two cases, it was decided that the clauses in the MacDC case were properly to be construed as conditional primary obligations 
and therefore did not engage the penalty clause rule at all. The court was unwilling to consider the reasonableness of the bargain and so did not strike the clauses down. In the parking eye case, however, the penalty clause rules were engaged, but the £85 fine was not out of all proportion to the legitimate social and economic interest which the car park operator had in preventing long stays in the car park and collecting sufficient revenues to adequately pay for the monitoring of the car park. So these cases provide us with um, some guidance as to the steps required to consider any potential offending clause. Firstly, you must consider whether the clause even engages the penalty clause rule. Is it a conditional primary obligation or a secondary obligation for the breach of a primary obligation? Secondly, if it does engage the penalty clause rules, is the sum a genuine pre-estimate of loss? If so, the penalty clause rules are satisfied even at that stage. But if it is not a genuine pre-estimate of loss, then the consideration is whether or not it is out of all proportion to the interest of enforcement of the primary obligation. And, is it, and if it is, and there is no other consideration to justify such a sum, then it would be struck down as a penalty. Our next case is M.T. Hogard against E.ON Climate and Renewables. This is an appeal in a hugely significant case regarding design liability and reliance on design standards. The first instance decision was one of our top five construction cases last year, um, which we discussed in our webinar last year. M.T. Hogard were the appointed contractor for the design, fabrication and installation of the turbine foundations for the Robin Rigg offshore wind farm project which was a 60 turbine, 180 megawatt array in the Solway Firth. The foundations consisted of a monopile, monopole sorry, driven into the seabed, followed by a transition piece into which the traditional wind turbine tower is placed and held. Now the contract required Hogarth to exercise reasonable skill and care in the design of the foundations, but Hogarth also warranted that the design, fabrication and construction of the foundations would be fit for purpose for 20 years. The contract also specified that Hogard were to use an internationally recognised design standard for the design of offshore wind turbine foundations, known as DNB OS J101. So the foundations were duly designed and installed, but shortly after completion, it was established within the industry that that design standard, namely DNV OS J101, it contained a fundamental formula calculation error, which would result in underperformance of foundations, causing movement, which would significantly reduce the design life. And sure enough, the Robin Rigg foundations did start to show signs of such movement, and that led to a requirement to spend 27 million, uh, million euros worth of remedial works in order to, to rectify that situation. So the question in that case was, who carried the responsibility um, for that situation? Now, at first instance, the judge decided that if the employer specifies a design standard, and the standard of care of the party using that design standard is reasonable skill and care, with no warranties as to design life, then in that situation, the employer will carry the responsibility and liability for any errors in the underlying design standard. Now that is unless the error in that standard is so obvious that, exercising reasonable skill and care, the designer should have spotted it, which is an objective test. But if there is, in addition to that, a warranty as to the fitness for purpose and the 20 year service life, which are absolute obligations, then the court at first instance decided that that trumps the specification of the design standard by the employer and so the contractor, in agreeing to that fitness for purpose warranty, takes on all risks, which includes the risk of defective design guidance, however trustworthy and whether specified for use by the employer or not. The appeal, the appeal rather, of that first instance decision was specific to the facts of the case, and the court, in fact, decided that the contract did not contain an absolute warranty for a 20-year service life, but was rather subject to a 20-year design life, which is what had been designed using the defective guidance. The court distinguished between service life and design life and noted that a majority of the references in the contract to 20 years were design life references, and in addition, 
The defective guidance um, that was um, the subject of the case um, also specified a 20-year design life rather than a 20-year service life. Accordingly, as there was no absolute warranty from the contractor, contrary to what the court at first instance held, the employer therefore carried the risk for the defective design guidance that they had specified. This appeal decision does not reduce the logic of the first instance decision, which is that if a contract contains an absolute warranty, then a contractor could be liable for failing to achieve a specific result, even if it had otherwise complied with a specific design guidance. However, for such a circumstance to arise, the absolute warranty would have to be worded with sufficient clarity and to be consistent with the rest of the contractual provisions surrounding the design. So the lesson from the first instance decision was that designers and contractors need to be alive to the standards which they are agreeing to, particularly if they are absolute standards or are formed in a warranty. Where there is a fitness for purpose or service life obligation, it cannot be assumed that compliance with specific, with specific or specified industry standards will be enough. Simply put, don't accept absolute obligations without considering the risks. The main lesson from the appeal decision is for employers, however, and that is that if you intend to incorporate an absolute warranty such as a service life warranty, then make sure the contract documents are consistently in support of that clear intention. Our ne next case is SSE Generation Limited against Hockety Solutions AG, which is about joint insurance. SSE had contracted with Hockety to design and build a new hydroelectric scheme at Glendo in Scotland, which included the creation of a major headrace tunnel through rock. The contract between the parties required the contractor to take out a joint names insurance policy to cover all contractor risk events. The contract also included an indemnity provision and a cap on total liability between the parties. Shortly after the project was completed and opened, the tunnel suffered a collapse, resulting in the complete shutdown of the scheme. Hochtisch firstly denied that they were responsible or bore the risk of the collapse, and so SSE had to employ a third party to undertake remedial works, claiming over £100 million in damages. But Hockey secondly and further argued that the joint insurance policy took the place of any liability between the parties so that SSE should have been making a claim under that insurance policy rather than pursuing Hockteef. This position was made on two grounds. Firstly, that where there is a joint names policy, parties can exclude claims against each other for losses covered by that policy. And secondly, that because the joint names insurance policy expressly waived subrogation rights, which would normally enable the insurer to step into the shoes of the innocent party to pursue the party who caused the loss, that that showed that the parties intended that they should not be able to make a claim against each other, even through the insurer, for the losses the insurance policy covered. SSE, however, disagreed with this analysis and contended that the contractual provisions and the insurance provisions should be kept separate and that looking at only the contractual provisions, they did not exclude claims for losses which were covered under the joint names insurance policy. The judge agreed with SSE uh, and stated that there is no irrebuttable presumption that the parties have no liability to one another simply because a joint names insurance policy is in place. And he also found that there was no express term in the contract addressing the issue and the inclusion of some other contractual terms, such as the indemnity provision and the cap on total liability, which would only be relevant if the parties could make claims against each other, suggested the parties did not intend for liability to, to be displaced by the joint insurance policy. This is an interesting case on, on a discrete point about joint insurance. The simple lesson to be taken from this case is that it is important that parties consider the purpose and impact of any required joint names insurance up front and then set out in their contract rather than in the insurance documents only whether the contract takes a place, whether the insurance policy takes a place of any contractual liability or whether the two can coexist. 
Now our next case is Scottish Power UK PLC against BP Exploration Operating Company Limited. There are a number of important aspects which have been drawn out of this case, but we will focus on the limitation and exclusion clause, clauses and um, also the aspects of contractual interpretation which surround these. SP had contracted with BP to purchase natural gas produced from the Andrew oil and gas field in the North Sea, which BP and others had the right to exploit. Now, the, the contractual arrangement was a take or pay arrangement whereby SP agreed to pay for a spe specified quantity of gas each year, even if it took delivery of less gas than the specified amount. However, from 2011 to 2014, the Andrew field was closed down in order to tie the field into another oil and gas field being developed. And so during that period, no gas was delivered to SP by BP under the contract. BP admitted that the failure to deliver gas during this period was a breach of the party's contract, but there was a dispute as to the measure of the damages applicable to that breach. BP argued that the consequences of non-delivery were exclusively provided for in the contract between the parties by a compensation mechanism which required BP to provide gas at a reduced price to SP once deliveries resumed. This, was, this argument was made on the basis of Article 16 of the contract, which said that the delivery of gas at the reduced price shall be in full satisfaction and discharge of all rights, remedies and claims, howsoever arising, whether in contract or in tort or otherwise in law, in respect of under deliveries. BP also claimed that um, Article 4.6 separately excluded any claim for other damages as it provided that, save as expressly provided elsewhere in this agreement, neither party shall be liable to the other party for any loss of use, profits, contracts, production or revenue, or for business interruption, howsoever caused, and even where the same is caused by the negligence or breach of duty of the other party. SP argued that they had an entitlement to damages at common law, i.e. out with the contract, and that, that those damages would be measured as the additional cost to SP of buying replacement gas from elsewhere during the period of non-delivery. SP argued that Article 16 did not apply for a wider breach of contract situation, and that was relevant because BP had not simply under-delivered, but actually had failed to comply with the standard of a reasonable and prudent operator when they decided to close down the Andrew Field for the tie-in. The court, however, considered that the phrase in respect of under-deliveries at the end of Article 16 meant that it was the sole remedy available to SP when the breach of contract caused the loss to SP because of the under-delivery of gas. Thus, the court rejected SP's arguments. The court did not think that this phrase was particularly precise and, th and it thought that it could be interpreted in support of either side's arguments, but the court considered the commercial purpose of the article and decided that it would be an improbable intention of the parties to create an automatic compensation arrangement for under delivery and still leave open the option for SP to pursue claims by another remedy. In other words, the commercial intention of the article must have been to create an exclusive remedy, the court said, and it considered that the non-supply during the shutdown period, even though caused by BP's decision to shut down the field, was an under-delivery under the contract, and accordingly, the exclusive remedy under Article 16 applied. The court did offer something of an olive branch to SP in their separate interpretation of Article 4.6, however, because the court set out three types of loss. Firstly, normal and basic loss caused by breach of contract. Next, secondary losses which go beyond the usual or normal measure. And third, more remote losses which can arise in special circumstances known to party. The court decided that Article 4.6 was not intended to exclude liability for all these heads of loss caused by the other party's breach, but rather was limited to secondary and more remote losses. So, the additional cost to SP of buying replacement gas from elsewhere during the period of non-delivery, the court said, 
was not a secondary loss or a remote loss and therefore would not have been limited by this clause. However, the exclusive remedy for under-delivery provided for by Article 16 still applied, and so to recover separately under 4.6, in addition, SP would need to demonstrate that losses flowed from a breach, which amounted to something more than undelivery. Now, the, the, um, the outcome of this case is not new law, but it is a useful reminder of the range of interpretations often available to the courts when considering contractual limitation clauses, and therefore the importance of considering how best to provide um, such contractual limitations. For exclusive remedy clauses, such as liquidated damages, care needs to be taken by employers or indeed contractors who wish to rely on clauses to um, provide a restriction of their loss, that these clauses are not setting up a protection with unintended consequences. So, for example, if the employer wishes to preserve a right to make a claim in a breach of contract situation, which is not a pure delay situation, um, such as where defects arise, so the wording needs to be um, very clear to cover that situation. For exclusion clauses such as Article 4.6, it is critical to dra draft sufficiently clearly as to whether it is primary losses or secondary losses that are being referred to. Although the courts often interpret loss of profits and loss of use in both categories, they did not do so in this case, and so an unclear clause will leave a potential exposure to an interpretation which does not necessarily follow the party's intentions. Exclusion clauses play a vital role in contractual risk allocation, so it is critically important to consider those risks, allocate them, and then ensure that the clauses adequately provide for those allocations. Our final case today is NH International Caribbean Limited against National Insurance Property Development Company Limited, which is a Privy Council decision on appeal from the Caribbean courts. This was a construction case where NH International had been engaged by National Insurance Property Development Company to construct a new hospital in Tobago under a FIDIC Red Book contract. The contractor had requested, under Clause 2.4 of the contract, financial information from the employer to demonstrate that the employer would be able to pay the contract price, as he was entitled to do under the contract. The contract states that the employer had 28 days to provide such information. After the provision by the employer of some limited information, which the contractor thought was inadequate, the contractor firstly suspended works and then terminated the contract. The employer, in return, attempted to set off sums to a counterclaim at the termination of the contract stage. Clause 2.5 of the contract governed set-off uh, and required that if the employer considers itself to be entitled to any payment under any clause of these conditions or otherwise in connection with the contract, it should, subject to certain specified exceptions, give notice and particulars to the contractor. The clause then goes on to provide that the notice shall be given as soon as practicable after the employer became aware of the event or circumstances giving rise to the claim. Firstly, the court uh, supported the notice provision of Clause 2.4, uh, the 28-day notice provision, and firstly held that insufficient information had been provided by the employer in response to the contractor's request within that contractual time period, and so accordingly, the contractor was entitled to, sus to suspend and terminate the contract. With regard to the counterclaim made at termination, the court considered that Clause 2.5 prohibited the employer from making any counterclaims or set-offs outside the contractual framework, and that the employer had not provided the required notifications as soon as practically possible, and was not validly able to raise their counterclaim upon termination. They did note that there may be other mechanisms available to the employer if, say, the employer considered that the work undertaken by the contractor was so poorly carried out as to not justify payment, but that that would be entirely separate to um, their purported set-off or counterclaim, uh, which in this case had not been sufficiently notified. This case is interesting because it echoes a judicial trend, certainly that's being felt here in Scotland, uh, but, and, and also elsewhere, that notice provisions will be interpreted um, fairly strictly 
and supported by the courts, even if the result of that support is that a perfectly good claim is killed off because of the failure to issue such a notice. The overall message is that you must always be aware of the notice provisions in your contracts and adhere to them in order to avoid a good claim being lost to you. That applies whether you are a contractor notifying a compensation event under NEC 3 or an employer notifying a counterclaim under FIDIC, as in this case. The more direct implication in, of this case is with regard to the employer's position uh, when they're using the FIDIC Redbook contract, who an employer should mitigate against uh, these types of risks when setting up their contracts and should consider deleting or at least amending these clo the clauses which may otherwise restrict their own claims through a project. Okay, we've now come to the end of the presentation, which we hope has been useful and interesting. And we still have just a couple of minutes to answer any questions. So if you haven't already done so, please type your questions into the chat box now. <clears throat> While you're doing that, I'll just take the opportunity to remind you that our next webinar will be at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, 3rd of February, and that will focus on the top five adjudication cases of last year. Both of these webinars will be recorded and will be available on our Vimeo, Vimeo site, so please do share the link with colleagues who may find this webinar useful. We'll circulate details of the recording and access to our Vimeo site to participants after the webinar. Now, it looks like we just have one, we have one question, which I'll just deal with quickly because time is running on, um, and that is that um, whether the strict enforcement of contractual notice provisions applies to just the form of the notice or its content or both. Now, the answer to that is, I mean, obviously it depends on the specific facts of the case, but generally speaking, um, the courts will strictly enforce um, the form requirements of contractual notice provisions. In other words, the form in which the, the contract says the notice must be given and the means of delivery. So the, uh, there may be a particular format in which the um, notice is required to be given under the contract. There may be a particular means of delivery, for example, recorded delivery post, and clearly the notice needs to be given to the correct party. As to the content of the notice, so say, for example, it's a notice of termination of contract, and the courts have generally taken a more relaxed approach, and uh, they often will apply the reasonable recipient test. In other words, they'll say, as long as the notice is in the correct form, has been sent by the specified means of delivery, and has been received by the required party, the correct party, then what the notice actually says will be judged according to the reasonable recipient. In other words, what would the reasonable recipient understand the notice to be or, or to say? Um, and it will give a bit more scope around the, the content of the notice. So, slightly different approach depending on which aspects of the notices you're looking at. But the critical thing is, if the contract says the notice must be given in this form and by this means of delivery and to this party, then you must comply with that, whether it's a termination notice or a, a notice of delay or that type of thing. Um, otherwise, uh, you could well fall foul of um, the, the court's strict enforcement of, of such notices. Okay, so I think that's, um, that's it, and our time is up. So thanks very much indeed for listening to us. We hope you found this webinar informative and useful, and we look forward to welcoming you to future webinars. Thank you very much. <laughs>